So hey everybody, I'm Raleigh Latham. Welcome back to those who are joining us for the Sustainable Design Masterclass. We're all about bringing some of the top regenerative designers in the world along with scientists, farmers, and entrepreneurs to give you a picture of some of the best pathways for the future, whether that's improving your land, your business, or your life. So today, um, Neil Spackman, alas, he can't be here till an hour into the Q&A. He's meeting with some hotshot Saudi investors for Albeda, which is a good thing, but I'll be taking his place. Um, just reminding you guys, if to get the most out of this webinar, turn off your Facebook. I know you guys were on Facebook, so turn it off. Turn off your phones, because there's going to be a lot of information coming your way. And if you want to get the most out of it, you want to be present for this. So today we are joined by Peter McCoy of Radical Mycology. Peter has made it his life's work to study the almost a lost art of fungi, of mycology. Because below all our feet, we are surrounded by the kingdom of fungi. It is a thing that unites all soils, all trees, all ecology, and yet we know so little about it. It has the ability to impact every aspect of our lives. It can make the difference between like failure and survival in the driest parts of the world and the wettest parts of the world. So I am stoked to bring on Peter McCoy because he's going to talk about how ecology can be used as a tool in our soils and in our ecology. So without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Peter. Welcome to the webinar, Peter. Yeah, thanks, Raleigh, for having me. Uh, thanks, everybody around the world and into the future watching this. Uh, I'm incredibly excited to talk about this topic. I don't think I've ever actually done a, a talk on soil fungi specifically, and there's so much to say um, about this, you know, huge black box of the soil, but even the fungal component, which is a, you know, a significant aspect of it. And mycology in general, as Raleigh said, is so commonly overlooked and just Un, you know, poorly understood generally, especially amongst, um, well, not necessarily especially, but including soil biologists, permaculturalists, people in regenerative agriculture. It's just this big missing piece of the puzzle that so much of my work is um, revolves around exploring, advocating for, and raising awareness around. And this is a, a big topic I'm especially excited about because it's so fundamental uh, right below our feet. Um, so yeah, let me dive in, and if we can. Um, uh, let's see. Share the slides if you can. Uh, I think switch it over so I can share yeah, my screen. Bad. I need to make you the presenter. Derp, derp. Okay, so here we go. Peter McCoy is going to come the presenter. So let me know that's switching over to you. Yeah. All right. Awesome. Great. Great. All right. Looking good. Looking all good. Let's start. Awesome. So, um, sort of as we were just saying, one thing I think it's really important to point out up front is that mycology, the study of fungi, is is actually considered a neglected mega science amongst academics, um, academic mycologists. Uh, on one hand, we nowadays know, after really only about a hundred years of good study, and probably even fifty years, really looking at fungal ecology, that fungi are integral to pretty much every aspect of the natural world. Uh, directly, in many ways, sometimes indirectly, um, and yet we know so little, and also so few people are actually studying it ac academically. And then on the same time, on the street level, you get very few books enabling people to study the topic. So by and large, it's very inaccessible. Most people don't know much about it. We don't learn much about it and uh, in our schooling and these types of things in the media. So I always point that out up front to, to point out that generally just culturally we have this uh, awareness gap and it's you know nobody's fault but something we need to be aware of and work collaboratively to overcome because you know we're missing out on so much. Um, over the years of you know human civilization and expansion and, and all these things we've probably impacted fungal ecologies in ways we've really yet to measure and understand. Uh, we measure, you know, the macro flora and fauna, but we, we never really look at the funga. Even today in environmental surveys, most uh, agencies don't consider the fungal component of an ecosystem. And, you know, that's something that's being advocated for changing by some organizations like the Fungi Foundation in Chile. But at the same time, generally speaking, even in our uh, environmental, you know, advocacy organizations, this is a missing component of the puzzle and analysis. So all that being said, 
there's so much that we can do as people interested in these topics and, and regenerating our habitats to advocate for fungi, whether just through uh, conversation or actually through intentional practice. Uh, a lot of our human impacts on the environment have, you know, caused extinctions and, and uh, suppression of certain organisms, including the fungi, including the soil fungi. Of course, a lot of tillage and, and using chemical inputs in the soil do a lot to disturb the soil ecology and, and including the fungal ecology of the soil. And just something to be aware of. Um, maybe for some of y'all, it doesn't, it doesn't need to be said. It's pretty apparent, but for others, just making that point clear. So fungi are integral, and the more you learn that, the more you start to recognize that, the more you sort of start thinking about fungi all the time. Of course, I'm biased, but I've seen that in many, many people, and it's, it's a really infectious topic because it's so uh, engaging and, and it's kind of like a life study when you really start to get into it. Um, also, it's really important to recognize, uh, without going too deep into this topic, is that essentially fungi have been uh, the soil builders of the planet um, essentially since the beginning of the Earth. Um, long story short, essentially the, the argument goes, and evolutionary biologists have argued, that the first larger complex organisms on the early Earth, on the supercontinent, of, which was basically sterile rock when it first formed, uh, after bacteria formed, uh, a couple of millions of years later, uh, lichens formed. And lichens today are the first things that show up after a lava flow or landslide. The fungal component of lichens, lichens are 95% fungal tissue. Uh, that fungal component releases really strong acids that can release minerals from, from the rock, uh, solubilize them, and also, of course, as they decompose, the lichens themselves decompose over time, they become sort of organic matter. And really, the, the first soils of the whole Earth were built by lichens and uh, primarily the fungal component of that. So they built the soils of the world since prehistory. Uh, they enabled plants to survive, develop roots. They built the soils back then, and they still do so much today in this regard. Um, <clears throat> so what are fungi? Um, fungi, the fungal kingdom, or the mycetae, is a group of eukaryotic organisms, so they have uh, nuclei in their cells, uh, so they're separate from bacteria, and they are distinguished from animals and plants in uh, several ways. On one hand, they have a unique component in their cell wall called ergosterol. It's sort of similar to our cholesterol, but it's just unique to fungi. Uh, their cell wall is not made out of cellulose like it is in plants, but primarily made out of uh, chitin and well, about 10 to 20 percent chitin and 80 to 90 percent high weight sugars. Some of those sugars can be medicinal. So their cell wall uh, you know, components are unique. Um, they store their energy as a form of sugar known as trehalose. So these are interesting side notes, but more importantly, more interesting for us is the way that they consume. Uh, they do not have a stomach, and they do not photosynthesize. Fungi, sort of like bacteria, uh, get their nutrition through external digestion. They release all kinds of acids and enzymes that are uniquely tailored to their environment. They constantly respond to their environment, and based on what is in their in their way, essentially, they will adjust the digestive enzymes uh, that they need to eat those things, sort of simply put, break down that food externally, and then consume the byproducts of it uh, through their tissue, through absorption. Um, <clears throat> within the fungal kingdom, we can see higher up uh, the top of this tree, uh, there's actually several subcategories in the fungal kingdom, just like there's different types of animals, there's many different types of fungi. Uh, but we're going to focus mostly on the three types I'm representing here. On the, the left, we have uh, a mold, a trichoderma mold, as a representative of a group known as the Ascomycota. This is our largest group of fungi that we've named the most of. Um, it includes many molds, but also some mushrooms and, and yeast as well. You can see them sort of hiding on the far left there. Yeast only make up about 1% of the whole fungal kingdom, so they're a very small portion. Uh, the vast majority form networks of tissue. They're more macroscopic or, or larger structured, rather. On the right, we see a large spore, and that's representing a group known as the glomeromycota. These are soil-dwelling fungi that don't form mushrooms, but as we'll see in a little while, are very, very important for soil ecology. Uh, they're arguably the most ecologically important of all fungi, and we'll get deep into them. And then in the middle, of course, are beautiful mushrooms that we're most familiar with in the fungal kingdom. And these, this one's representing the basidiomycota. This is the category that contains the vast majority of our more commonly cultivated, wild harvested, 
edible, medicinal, remediative mushrooms, macro fungi. Um, so we'll talk most about these three categories. The other, the other groups are more micro fungi. Um, not as much to say about them ecologically. Of course, they're important, but just for time's sake, we'll, we'll sort of bypass them for today. Um, also to note is that the fungal kingdom is incredibly large, whereas there's about 300,000 plants in the world, and we've named about 95% of them. Estimates of the fungal kingdom go anywhere from 1.5 to 6 million species, and we've named only about 75,000 or 1.5 to 5%, depending on you know what estimate you're looking at. So in essence, we know so little about fungi, we've named so few of them. And that's just, of course, naming them, uh, let alone understanding their ecological function and how to engage with them as humans. How do we cultivate them? Uh, what medicines do they produce? And how can we apply them into our designs intentionally? So this is where we're at, um, sort of long story short, mycology being a young, neglected science in this way. It's only about 200 years old. And uh, again, you know, we barely scratched the surface, really largely in this ecological perspective in the last you know, 100 years or less as we, we start to uh, span out or fan out in our perceptions. So um, of the fungal kingdom, as I said, only about 1% form uh, are uh, develop as yeast. And yeast are important in the soils. Um, they likely contribute to nutrient cycling, and they're actually probably a good food source for a lot of microbes and insects. But soil yeast are pretty poorly understood. Uh, we can say that about a lot of things about mycology. So, you know, we know so little about some of these aspects, unfortunately. Um, and yeast just being one part of that in the soil. The vast majority of fungi, what we're mostly going to focus on, are those that form networks of tissue uh, that are, that's known as mycelium. Uh, mycelium is uh, interesting biologically and physiologically and how it grows, but in essence, it's a network of one cell thick uh, threads, filaments of tissue that grow from their tip, um, constantly responding and engaging with the environment at that tip. Uh, that's where all the digestive enzymes and acids are released and the byproducts of the digestion are consumed. And that's really what the fungus is. You know, most fungi don't form mushrooms. They live as a network of mycelium, like a mold or what have you, uh, fanning through the soil, fanning through the wood, doing all this interesting work that we'll get into. And this is really what the fungus is. You know, some of them produce different looking spores. We call them different species, but sort of fundamentally, uh, this is the fung primary fungal tissue. Um, of course, some mushrooms condense, or some fungi rather, condense that mycelium into a macro structure we call a mushroom, but even that is just condensed mycelium. It's not different tissue, not a different organ. So here again, it's all mycelium, 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 um, and that's where all the business happens, uh, sort of simply put. So where do we find fungi? Um, well, fungi live in all environments. Uh, some of the extremes are represented here, but of course we find them in, in the more common environments that we inhabit. Uh, on the upper left is a photo from a study that came out earlier this year, essentially arguing that of what we know of marine fungi, it seems highly plausible that mycelium uh, permeates the entire ocean floor, which is the world's largest habitat. And just as on land, it's very likely that the soil mycelium uh, the, so the ocean floor of mycelium, which is a, a sort of a type of soil, if you will, uh, is what takes in the dead ocean life and churns it up and breaks it down and recycles those nutrients and releases it back to the whole ocean. Uh, and of course, a lot of those nutrients end up back on land. So fungi are fundamentally at the bottom of much of the world's food web uh, in this way, and they do this nutrient cycling role as, as one of their primary functions um, on the terrestrial plane. On the upper right, we see a cryptobiotic crust community in uh, desert ecosystems. We'll talk a little bit more about them later. We can actually try to cultivate these, but they're very important in these dry land environments because they stabilize soils. These are, these are communities, uh, excuse me, of fungi, lichens, uh, cyanobacteria, uh, micro plants, and they basically create micro pits and valleys that can collect water, hold habitat and space and shelter for seeds, enabling them to be established in these environments. And even when we get deeper into it, as we'll see later, they actually uh, fix a lot of nitrogen for these ecosystems, and the fungal component helps translate and translocate that nitrogen and other nutrients throughout those ecosystems. So these really complex communities um, take a very long time to develop. If you go to these environments, you often see signs saying, don't bust the crust, because they take hundreds of years to develop. And very likely, much of our, you know, I imagine that much of our desert ecosystems in North America, other parts of the world had these communities, but you know, human intervention um, and just animal compaction has destroyed a lot of them. 
Um, so just something to consider in, in deserts about how we can restore these these uh, communities to help stabilize the soil, reduce erosion, and uh, increase water holding capacity. At the bottom, sort of hiding there, is a photo of um, the, the ground crust, if you will, I guess the soil of Antarctica. And what we're seeing is just below the, the surface layer is a black layer of melanized fungi that filter the intense UV of the sunlight in Antarctica for the plant component, the algal layer, uh, right below it. So this is a type of lichen that hides inside of rock. They're known as cryptoendoliths. And my, my friend has, studies these, and these are much more abundant than plants in Antarctica. There are about two flowering plant species and over 430 lichens or lichen-like associations in Antarctica. Much of them look like this, hiding in the crust layer, sort of the soil, if you will, of Antarctica. Um, so here again, you know, we find fungi in all these extreme environments, uh, incredibly resilient, incredibly abundant, and you know, integrally playing roles in nutrient cycling. Uh, of course, we're more focused today on the you know terrestrial environment and our our terrestrial soils, and uh, probably a lot of you know, but maybe some of you don't, that soils form sort of in from the top and from the bottom. Uh, down below, there's the parent material bedrock that is slowly over the eons worn down into sort of smaller and smaller mineral bits, and uh, part of that we think is through, of course, erosion and and some microbes can break down slowly break down minerals. Uh, but so do fungi, as we'll see. They they very much are involved in releasing minerals from clay and rock, and I think play a big part in the slow dissolve of, of parent material into the mineral component of soils from below. And then up top, we have the organic material that falls down from plants and everything else, and that slowly degrades into the more organic component. Fungi, as we'll see, are integral to that decomposition. And then in the middle, we get a gradation of the blend of the two. And you know, different types of soils are basically different ratios of these components. So how do fungi contribute to both ends of the spectrum, the, the mineral end and the organic end? And, and what do they do once that soil is formed? This is what we're focusing on today. So on the mineral end, fungi. Uh, on one hand, both dissolve rock, if, if you will, uh, break it down, release those minerals. And on the other end, they can actually recombine certain uh, elements and create minerals in the soil through biomineralization, as we call it. So on the left, we're looking at uh, a topic known as geomycology. This is a term coined by a researcher by the name of Gad. And uh, many, many types of fungi, many microfungi molds have been shown to break down all kinds of rocks. So in the middle, we see many types of rock that fungi have been shown to grow on, uh, release minerals from, primarily through the release of really strong acids that, again, they release from the tips of that mycelial network. Uh, oxalic acid is a common one, malic acid, citric acid, and a few others are quite abundant. And these really strong acids, um, they have a high, K, uh, excuse me, a, a strong KPA point for, uh, or PKA point, excuse me, for the chemists out there. But it's really strong acid, and it can release these minerals quite well into the environment, both for the fungus, but also for the plants it associates with. Uh, the two molds on the bottom uh, have been shown to release aluminum from alumina silicates clays. So that's uh, pretty interesting, in my opinion. So just like some bi microbes have been known to solubilize and release minerals, um, and there's a lot of study around bacteria in this regard. Fungi do it as well, but as with so many areas of mycology, this is just really poorly looked at. And then that information of what we know just has not translated out and rippled into the ecologist and you know soil-minded folks amongst us. So even though you haven't heard a lot about it, it doesn't mean it's important. I think that's just, again, I'm, I'm hitting this point home hard because it's so much of my work is saying, yes, this is maybe new information to you, but it might be incredibly important to our environmental analysis and our and our perspectives. Uh, we just need to look more at it and we need to talk about it more and really analyze the, the depth and magnitude of these kinds of concepts. Um, so there's that. They release a lot of minerals and at the same time they, they help recombine minerals uh, or real elements in the soil and create different sinks. So some strong examples are their, the combination of calcium and carbon into different compounds like wheatolite, um, and waywalite is another one. These are two really common carbon uh, minerals in the soil, some of the biggest carbon sinks. These are likely produced by fungal uh, biomineralization. So what we're seeing in the top picture with the A is actually a fungal hyphal thread covered in weedalite crystals. So it's a pretty amazing photo, in my opinion. 
Um, so it's producing this, creating a sink of calcium and carbon in the soil. Below a uh, paper I just actually came across researching for the webinar, it just came out a couple months ago talking about how it's very likely that fungi actually produce calcite, another uh, important calcium and carbon sink in the soil through mineralization. Bacteria have been thought to do this, and they probably and they do it to some degree. But again, the fungal component, this is a new paper saying nobody's really looked at this notion, do fungi create the calcite in our soil as well? And many other minerals in our environment, very likely fungi produce or contribute to the production of, uh, helping sink these minerals and then later perhaps releasing them as needed. So uh, as my friend says, fungi are nature's greatest chemists. They do so many things chemically that are unparalleled by bacteria, animals, and plants. And this is just one example of that. Um, <clears throat> They uh, uh, also influence soil pH in, in a variety of ways. Uh, one common example is that various types of soil fungi release this oxalic acid, which of course is acidic, so it, they release uh, more of that, so the arrow is going up. And they can also uptake ammonium, which also contributes to the lowering of pH. And in lower pH uh, environments, many minerals and, and metals and uh, trace elements are more available to plants. So it helps lower the pH. This is why fungal uh, soils are a bit more acidic. They contribute to that acidification so that uh, plants can get the nutrients they need. Um, arguably, if you want to think about it in, in this sort of meta picture, uh, with fungi sort of contributing to the growth of life on the terrestrial plane at least, you know, in many ways it's, I, I sort of see it as fungi sort of sculpt our environments. They really contribute to the flow of nutrients and they fundamentally determine what plants and, and ultimately animals can live in an environment. And this is in one way where they're really uh, directly contributing to so much of the soil design and, and then the environmental design that comes from that. Um, and then on the other end, uh, we have the, decom the decomposing fungi that break down the organic matter. And this happens in a myriad of ways. Uh, fungi are responsible for 90% of decomposition on the planet. And, about, and bacteria primarily fill in the, the gaps. You know, they really eat the smaller stuff that fungi have released from the more complex compounds. Um, of course, bacteria can readily eat simple things like sugars when they're available, but stuff that's locked up in, say, you know, lignin, which is nature's most complex compound, only fungi can break down lignin. Lignin's what makes wood hard and rigid, and the fungi make that available. Um, so we have a, many different types of decomposers. Uh, what I'm showing here are, of course, on the upper left, beautiful reishi mushroom. Many of the mushrooms we cultivate commercially for food medicine are decomposers. They don't have symbiotic relationships. They just eat dead things. Uh, some fungi can eat, uh, even attack living organisms like uh, uh, nematodes, as we see in the upper right. Some will actually eat micro insects like springtails and actually uh, attack them uh, living and suck out their life, if you will, and feed that through their trees partners. Um, but primarily when we're thinking about soil building, the decomposers are integral to that because, of course, they're decomposing, but also adding many of the important components to the soil. Uh, specifically, wood decomposers are a major piece of this puzzle, wood being a major nutrient store and trees, of course, being a major component of our land systems. Uh, there's two main types of, of wood decomposers. There's, there's really three, but there's two we mostly focus on. On the left are the brown rotters that break down cellulose and hemicellulose leaving behind the blocky lignin. This brown rot material, cubicle brown rot, CBR as we call it, might actually be a really important con uh, component of soils. It's like a sponge, kind of like nature's biochar, as my friend says. Holds a lot of water, nutrients, uh, roots will grow into it, microbes are found habit inhabiting it, uh, mycelium will grow into it, sort of sucking out the nutrients that it stores, and it's often overlooked in soil surveys. So again, we, we miss out on this component that might actually be pretty important. On the right, we have the white rot, which is produced by the only fungi that can break down lignin. The only things in the world that can break down lignin are about 2,000 species of fungi. They, leave, they eat the lignin, leave behind the stringy cellulose, and this has actually been argued to perhaps contribute to the production of some of the humic acids and humic substances in our soils. Um, of course, we don't quite know how humic substances form, and it's been argued that perhaps uh, some of the byproducts of delignification might be part of that uh, structuring. The, the byproducts of that uh, look very similar to these, these uh, humic substances, so that's a theory that's out there. It's kind of interesting. Okay, um, so what kind of fungi do these things? Um, well, we have a lot of molds in the soil, and some are better studied than others. Uh, one 
to be aware of for gardeners and things like this are the trichoderm species. These are a very ubiquitous uh, genus of fungi around the world. Uh, several species have been heavily investigated for their ability to uh, primarily defend against other fungi. These are actually major check and balance in the soil and even though they don't look so pretty, uh, they're actually very important for fighting off other fungal pathogens. So you can easily grow this mold. It, it's a mold and it grows on almost anything sugary and wet and then you can apply it to the root zones of plants and it will defend against uh, pathogens. Um, of course, you have to try to bring that in before the pathogen gets there. If the pathogen's already taken over, it's it's kind of hard for the trichoderma to win, but it's always worth a shot if you're in a kind of do-or-die scenario with your plants. Um, and they can also be added to compost piles and actually speed up the decomposition of compost piles quite rapidly. They have really strong cellulases. They break down plant matter very quickly. And there's lots, actually, a lot of research been done with trichoderma in both these regards, so easy to look up and learn about trichoderma if this is new to you. Uh, where we're mostly going to focus on for a good little while now are the fungi that are perhaps the most studied in soil systems, which are the mycorrhizal species. Uh, myco meaning fungus, rhiza meaning root. These are fungi that symbiotically uh, form a relationship with plant roots, clamping onto the roots and exponentially increasing their surface area 10 to 1,000 fold. So we can see that in the, the photos in the upper left, where the uninoculated plant with its roots can't really access a lot of nutrients. Uh, roots, in many ways, are, in my mind, like porous anchors. They hold the plant in place, but they haven't evolved to do the chemical work needed to transform nutrients and bring them in. Uh, they've primarily evolved to rely on fungi and other microbes to do this work for them. The oldest plant fossil with roots has this relationship from about 450 million years ago, and today 90 to 95 percent of all plants form or can form this relationship, and many of them, like melons, uh, oaks, pines, citrus plants, grapes will not survive in the wild without these mycorrhizal partners. Um, in our croplands we have to heavily fertilize and provide you know, all kinds of defense chemicals and stuff to sort of try to mimic what the fungus naturally does. Many of our crops will significantly benefit from the introduction of these fungi because they not only fan out and, and access nutrients and do all this chemical work that the plant just can't do. They also draw in water, uh, enabling greater drought resistance. Uh, they can stabilize the plant in a, in a bunch of ways, as we'll, we'll get deeper into. And even beyond that, they connect many plants together in, a, in an intact forest system. Uh, one mycelial network could connect potentially hundreds or thousands of species of plants together in what we call a common mycelial network, a CMN, and intelligently, so it seems, or at least very efficiently, distribute nutrients amongst those organisms in ways that keeps everything going and everything alive. This is how the baby trees survive in the depths of the forest. Uh, it's by the mycorrhizal fungi providing sugars from the mother tree that's reached the canopy. Um, there's other studies that have shown that say when a, one plant gets hit with aphids, uh, the mycorrhizal fungi will translate some sort of information to other plants in the system, and those plants will start to produce anti-aphid compounds even though the aphids haven't gotten there yet. And that's actually a pretty significant influence um, kind of rippling out to, you know, whole insect populations ecologically, you know, all these dimensions we can't exactly fathom. So they're integral to forest health, and we'll get deeper and deeper into this. Um, there's only about six or so fungal species, 6,000, excuse me, fungal species that form this relationship that we know of. Again, 90 to 95% of plants form it. And in a healthy soil system, every gram of soil might have a mile or so of fungal mycem. So it's kind of like our capillary system, very efficiently packed, very uh, high surface to volume ratio, fills a lot of space and access to a lot of nutrients and does all this interesting stuff. Um, there's about seven types of mycorrhizal fungi that we um, differentiate uh, here in the drawing representing five of the more common ones. And I won't go into the details, but you can kind of see that it's based on the structures they form, how deep they go into the root, and if they penetrate into the root cell wall itself. Uh, the formation is, seems to primarily be caused when the plant is starved for nutrition. Um, if the plant is overly fertilized, it doesn't need the fungus, and so if we're dumping you know, inputs into the soils, then the, the, the relationship won't form. So if you buy products that tout having mycorrhizal fungi, but they're also nutrient-rich, uh, it's kind of a marketing scheme that isn't necessarily going to benefit you, in, in, at least in the mycorrhizal regard. Um, Primarily, it seems to happen when the, the, the plant is, is sort of starved, especially of phosphorus um, and nitrogen. 
And under those stressful conditions, the spores need to be introduced to the root zone of the plant. You can't top dress the soil uh, and the spore will germinate. There'll be a sort of a communication and the plant allows the fungus in, if you will. There's different types of entries. Um, some fungi only form on the surface of the root and form a, a thicker layer and only go into a couple uh, layers deep into the root. And these are known as ectomycorrhizal fungi on the, on the far right. Uh, they don't necessarily penetrate into the root uh, cell itself. They can maybe enshroud a cell, but they don't uh, go into the cell. And this is most of our wild mushrooms and truffles, and we'll talk more about them. Uh, on the left, we have the uh, representative of the endomycorrhizal fungi. And these are fungi that usually go deeper into the root, but more specifically, more importantly, actually penetrate through the cell wall, uh, not the cell membrane. So they don't go into the center of the cell, but they, they enter the cell to a degree and form different structures to exchange nutrients with the, the plant partner. And there's several types of these endomycorrhizal fungi. Uh, the most common and the one you might hear about the most are the arbuscular mycorrhizae being represented here, but there's several others we'll talk about. Uh, generally speaking, mycorrhizal fungi do lots of things in the environment. Uh, one of their main roles is providing nutrients, uh, whereas on the, you know, on the left we're showing that our attempts to provide nutrients to plants, at least artificially, not talking about organic fertilizers and you know, natural fertilizers, and the most extreme, we, we you know, strip mine uh, phosphorus rock in this example, dip it in acid to release the phosphorus, all to create a water-soluble form of phosphorus that the plant can just naturally and passively absorb. Of course, fungi naturally transform this in the soil. They'll use their acids to release phosphorus from rock, provide it to the plant, and you know, we can significantly reduce our fertilizer input and, of course, all the environmental uh, impacts that can come along with those inputs. Uh, so the plant provides a lot of nutrients, lots and lots of studies leading to higher nutritional content, medicinal quality, flowering rates in the plant, um, overall greater growth rates and survival time of the roots, and even shortening the time it takes the plant to reach maturity. Uh, they also do a lot to defend the plant, both as a physical barrier when the mycelium is enshrouding the root tip, um, but also by releasing all kinds of antibiotic compounds. Uh, they can release their own. They can influence the plant's own defense mechanisms. Uh, like I said, with the uh, insect or bivory thing, that's the vast ecological effects there on the third point. Uh, the fungus itself might just compete for nutrients and outcompete competitors. Uh, it can also stimulate the growth of other beneficial microbes. Um, overall, increasing the plant health and there again, reducing our need for pesticide inputs. So lots of, lots of studies have been done with mycorrhizal fungi, especially the, the arbuscular mycorrhizae I just mentioned. Um, and we know a lot about them. So these arbuscular endomycorrhizal fungi, or usually we just call them the AM fungi or AMF, um, they are endos, meaning they go into the cell wall, as I'm showing in the lower right there. That's an actual photograph of an arbuscule, this uh, branch structure that enters the cell wall. Uh, but they're not the only endomycorrhizae. So some people just call all endos, or all, it is simply called them the endomycorrhizae, but that's, that's vague. It's not specific because there's actually multiple types of endos, so just clarifying that. More specifically, there are the arbuscular mycorrhizal or arbuscular endomycorrhizae, if you want to be really specific. There's about 169 of these species or morpho species. They're in the group, the glomeromycota, I mentioned at the beginning, and many of them are ubiquitous around the world. Um, that being said, there's many, many different types of these. In the center, we can see their large spores are actually packed with hundreds or even tens of thousands of unique uh, genetically distinct nuclei, uh, which is fascinating and very strange biologically, but for our purposes, translates to the fact that they got a lot of genetic potential and they can utilize that to adapt to their environment, uh, basically shift whatever sort of genetic expression they need based on uh, what their environment demands. So. This kind of translates into not importing some of these soil fungi. It's usually better practices in, in many regards to work with the local fungi because they're going to be adapted to your environment. And this is this translates to all fungi and cultivation, but here in this soil example is a, is a strong, <coughs> excuse me, strong one. Um, on the left, we're showing the, the uh, a photo of the first plant with root fossils, or first, uh, excuse me, first fossilized plant with roots from about 460 million years ago. And here we find on its roots uh, an arbuscular mycorrhizal fungus that looks very almost identical to species we find today. So it's a very ancient relationship. Uh, hasn't changed necessarily a ton over all these eons and uh, incredibly efficient, you know, found throughout the world. 
They're found on every continent uh, except Antarctica, in forests, deserts, aqua aquatic environments, grasslands, salt marshes, you know, pretty much everywhere. Generally more alkaline soils, uh, more mineral rich. They're usually in the more mineral rich layers of the soils, or perhaps contributing to some of that uh, mineral release. And they're the ones that really connect plants together. They're the uh, generalists that don't discriminate, and they're connecting 85 to 95 percent of all plants. They're super densely packed in one milli uh, square meter of soil. Their surface area might cover 90 square meters, um, so they're accessing a lot, a lot of that soil. Uh, lots have been said about them. Uh, they are the most studied plant symbiosis um, because of their, you know, incredible importance. They've increased, been shown to increase many crops uh, production rates, as we've seen in the stat statistics. Uh, in some, when the plants are stressed or starved, they can provide up to 80% of the phosphorus input. Uh, their benefit can help us reduce our fertilizer input significantly, especially phosphorus and nitrogen. They can even reduce nitrate, which is a pretty uh, metabolically taxing process. They've been shown to be defensive against fusarium and phytophthora diseases, very common root rot uh, issues and uh, they're a very important water source for desert plants. Uh, one of the most important things about the Arbuscular mycorrhizae is they produce a unique sticky protein on the surface of their mycelium called glomlin. This is like a super glue of the soil, and it's very persistent, lasting upwards of 50 years in the soil, uh, likely due to its iron content. It is uh, unique to these fungi, and it's produced on the surface, probably to hydrate and lubricate them, but it also helps stick the soil together, and <clears throat> basically creates macro aggregates that enable the greater tilth and structure in the soil that we all appreciate for water and air percolation, root movement, worm wiggling, etc. Really important for, for that aspect, also helps reduce erosion, desertification, thereby increasing uh, water holding capacity and suppressing fires, uh, really integrally contributing to the structure of soil, the health of soil overall. Um, uh, remediation wise, it can actually bind up some metals and it's been argued to, and actually been shown to be one of the major carbon sinks in the soil. It actually might be one of the biggest carbon sinks uh, on its own right, this protein, but when you take into the mycelium itself, which is a huge fungal, a uh, huge component of the soil and a huge carbon component, fungi and the glomlin might actually be one of the biggest, if not the biggest, carbon sinks in the soil. So when we're talking about trying to sink carbon out of the atmosphere, we need to think about getting more soil, more fungi going in our soils, not necessarily trees. I mean, trees come along with that, but we never want to forget the fungal component. So humic acids only sink about 8% of the soil carbon for, for relation. Um, on the bottom we're showing, uh, you can actually extract glomalin. Uh, there's processes out there, a little bit technical, and we're showing when you extract it, what does the soil look like? So it actually adds a lot of the color and uh, shading to the soil, which is interesting. Uh, we can cultivate them. So on the left, I'm showing a photo from the Rodale Institute. They actually spent six, seven years working with farmers to figure out ways to grow a lot of AM cultivation, uh, inoculum cheaply and abundantly uh, for farmers. So you can look up the Rodale mycorrhizal cultivation protocol. It's pretty simple, straightforward. Basically grow a grass or allium or some quick growing plant in a pot or bag and the roots and mycelium down below and harvest at the end of the season and apply to your crops the following year. Pretty straightforward. A lot of benefits, and especially if we're working with the local fungi, uh, local soils from a healthy forest and amplifying that soil and those mycorrhizae up. On the right, um, showing more technical processes that the uh, West Virginia University is researching. They have a big arbuscular mycorrhizal research department where you can actually sieve your soil and separate out these spores, quantify their numbers and diversity, good for soil analysis, also to good to track the efficacy of any attempts to cultivate these fungi and increase their abundance in depleted soils. You know, it's a nice metric to actually see how the fungal spore loads are increasing, changing over time, um, et cetera. So there's more information there. This is all covered in my book, uh, which Raleigh didn't mention, but I have a lot of information about these fungi in my book, Radical Mycology. A couple other types uh, to give a shout out to the ericoid endomycorrhizal fungi are primarily restricted to ericoid species or plants in the ericaceae. Um, they're mostly Ascomycota and they mostly associate with the erica, caluna, and uh, vaccinium, so like blueberries and relatives, heather plants. They're more in the acidic soils that these plants prefer, grasslands, tundras, heathlands, uh, boreal forests, 
uh, in some heathlands, the soil can be a 2.5 pH, like lemon juice, and yet these fungi enable plants to survive. They're doing all the work we've talked about so far. And at the same time, they can actually act as the primary decomposers of that whole ecosystem. So if the same plant they relate with dies and falls over, that fungus digests it and returns its nutrients to its uh, brethren. So these have actually been called the drivers of these whole ecosystems because they intimately and directly control the flow of nutrients. Uh, pretty powerful work. And yet again, these fungi, for all their interesting facets, are pretty poorly understudied. Um, we do know that they can benefit blueberry plants in our own garden when we bring in the right type of aracoid fungi, not just our generic other fungi, mycorrhizae. They're not all the same off the short store shelf. And there are some products coming out with aracoid mycorrhizae specifically, so you can look out for those. Um, <clears throat> A couple other types of fungi, uh, mycorrhizal fungi, just to recognize uh, all the monotropa plants that don't photosynthesize are fed by mycorrhizal fungi. They form a other type of association known as the monotropoid endomycorrhiza. Um, basically, it's the, the fungus connects to these monotropa plants, the pink, the white, the kind of stranger looking plants in the forest. And then on the other end of that mycelial network connects to a tree or other plants and channels nutrients uh, to the monotropa to feed it. Pretty interesting relationship. It's usually seen as a one-directional uh, relationship, but it does seem that the fungus might get some benefit from it, or at least it can go both directions. Studies have shown this. Interesting fungus that does this is our king bolete or porcini, a, a delicious and prized gourmet edible, actually forms this relationship. Uh, on the right, we have the orchidaceous endomycorrhizae, which all orchids form when they germinate. All orchids do not photosynthesize. They need these fungi for their survival, sometimes for years, sometimes for the whole life of the orchid. Um, they pack, these fungi pack their mycelium into the root cells, feed the orchid, and, and do similar things. They can either be digesting wood or connecting to other plants to retrieve these nutrients. Uh, many common woodland mushrooms, like Rusula species, do this. Uh, a really interesting one is the armillaria or honey mushrooms in the lower right. Uh, often seen as a pathogen, a problem, a parasitic mushroom actually feeds and supports a lot of orchids at the same time that it kills off some trees. So interesting dual relationship there. Uh, our most common or probably our most familiar mycorrhizal types of fungi are the ectomycorrhizae that form mushrooms and truffles. These form a thick layer of mycelium around the root tips. Uh, these are known as a mantle sheath. So you can see it's really thick there. There's no root being exposed. They're mostly in the more uh, organic rich upper layers of soils, usually higher elevation, uh, you know, older forests typically. Uh, this is, includes our chanterelles, our boletes, our gourmet truffles. These are the ones we wish we could cultivate, but as of yet, only a few species we've dialed in, uh, mostly ones that don't seem to be as uh, dependent on appropriate or really specific soil conditions. Uh, this is a big hurdle for us growers in the future is in the present as well is trying to figure out the right soil conditions, microbial, insect communities, other plant communities that say chanterelles need to fruit in our own backyard. Right now we can't do that consistently. That's why they're wild harvested. Whoops. Uh, there are some species that we can cultivate, ectomycorrhizae, uh, that are commonly cultivated for uh, silviculture, tree plantations, like where I live, Douglas fir and western hemlocks are all inoculated with uh, commonly lacaria mushrooms, which are actually edible medicinal, so it is an extra crop, they're just not gourmet. Or say Pithylissus tinctorius on the uh, left there, not so pretty, but actually a very important mushroom to trees around the world. Very heat tolerant, can survive in 104 degree Fahrenheit soils, actually quite uh, beneficial to trees in, in those kind of hotter environments. Uh, establishes with many trees around the world, very common species, doesn't always fruit, but it's very common in soils, um, and it establishes quite readily with trees, so it's an easy one to work with. Other common uh, species we can grow to inoculate our trees are in the Rhizopogon, uh, Hebaloma, and Swillus genera. Uh, Pithylithus is also important because it can associate with over 50 trees and tolerate soil pHs anywhere from 2.6 to 8.4. That's a huge range, so it's an incredibly tolerant uh, fungus, well adapted uh, to helping trees. In desert environments, uh, desert truffles can support a lot of uh, plant species, uh, especially heliathemum uh, shrubs. And these desert truffles are a protein and medicine source and traditionally consumed by Bedouin cultures and many other cultures in North Africa, the Middle East, uh, Mediterranean climates. 
uh, spoken about for a thousand years by the Prophet Muhammad, this type of thing. And we can cultivate them. It's not necessarily a common practice. I'm certainly interested in seeing more folks, say, in North America taking this on and seeing how viable it is as a industry and a uh, supplemental food crop in, say, like, you know, California, Southern California or, or Eastern Washington, you know, things like this. Uh, I don't think anybody's really looking at it as far as I'm aware. Probably a lot of interesting stuff possible there. Seems to be pretty interesting as far as I've read. Uh, would love to see other folks exploring this topic. But desert truffles, big history, uh, pretty big like a potato, and supposedly tastes really good. Uh, a couple other fungi just to be aware of. Um, Dark septate endophytes, this is sort of a thing you might not have heard of. These are root-associated uh, endophytic fungi. Endophytes live inside of plant tissue. They actually all plants are permeated in, in, throughout their entirety by hundreds of trillions of fungi. It's sort of a side topic. But these fungi are, are only found in, in roots. Uh, interestingly, they only associate, or they, 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 they can associate rather, with the few plants that don't form true mycorrhizal associations, like our brassica plants. So they actually might be helping be sort of performing that mycorrhizal role while not being true mycorrhizae. We can cultivate them, we can inoculate seeds with these types of fungi, but studies are very limited at this point about what the benefit is and even potentially negative, you know, uh, blowback from doing this. So just always being cautious with new practices, but interesting to know about. Uh, these are fungi that are found in those cryptobiotic crust communities and desert systems shown on the bottom, and they've actually been argued to help translate or translocate some of the fixed nitrogen that's uh, created in these crusts to the other plants in the environment. Uh, this is known as a fungal loop hypothesis, and you can look that up on Wikipedia. There's, a, there's an article there. Also in soils, we get other pathogens and, and other bad fungi, if you will. I consider these the vocal fungi. I think in many ways this is just a slight perception change and paradigm shift where when we see these fungi doing quote-unquote bad things into our crops and woodlands, I think the question we need to ask is what did we do to bring this about as humans? Uh, there's a great book called The Triumph of the Fungi by the mycologist Nicholas Money that sort of points out and lays the facts that most of the great fungal blights of history were caused by human mismanagement of an ecosystem. Of course, monoculturing sort of being an extreme example of that where we strip away endophytic and mycorrhizal diversity, the plants are left defenseless, and sure enough, something comes in to sort of reset the scales. Uh, so the, yeah, these fungi are ever present, uh, but why why don't they win out in the woods everywhere? You know, uh, I think it's because we don't have the right populations, perhaps of certain types of fungi, and also because sometimes, of course, we accidentally as humans import a fungus and it just wins the battle because it has no natural competitors. So of course that can happen. Uh, <clears throat> Fungi are integral to nutrient cycling in all these roles. Um, on the phosphorus end, they can break down organic matter, uh, decompose it through their phosphates uh, from normal organic sources. With their strong acids, as I mentioned, they can release um, inorganic phosphorus from clays and also uh, mineral phosphates. Uh, we are, of course, facing peak phosphorus in the future, so reducing our extraction of phosphorus from unsustainable sources is going to be important. Bringing these mycorrhizal fungi and other microbes to help naturally do this um, is going to be really important and is now and certainly into the future. Uh, for the carbon cycle, fungi, decomposing fungi provide almost 98% of the carbon dioxide needed for the vegetation in the world. Humans and other animals provide, you know, less about 2% of the rest. Uh, about a third of all fungal biomass is carbon, and much of that is stored in soils. Again, with the glomalin, that's a major soil carbon sink that we need to be aware of in our studies. And that might be one of the primary, or might be even the primary, it's been argued, carbon source for whole micro soil microbial communities and fluorescent pseudomonads, monads, uh, nomads. Um, that's a huge ecological impact that is often very much overlooked. Um, so what I'm showing at the bottom is plants photosynthesize and trap CO2, turn it into sugars, which translates into mycelium and even mushrooms and truffles that animals eat to spread around that carbon. The nitrogen cycle, uh, fungi uh, help release it through, of course, normal decomposition and, and organic matter release. Uh, many ectomycorrhizal mushrooms uh, will scavenge for ammonium. They don't usually prefer nitrate, so they'll actually help sort of gather that for the plants, which also prefer uh, ammonium, generally speaking, so they can help uh, gather that. Um, they tend to dominate in more nutrient or nitrogen poor soils, whereas the arbuscular mycorrhizae tend to predominate in phosphorus poor soils, uh, something to be aware of. 
And as I mentioned a little bit ago, some species like little carry mushrooms actually can eat insects. And in one study, they found up to 25% of the nitrogen in a lycaria associated tree was actually provided from these insects. So even just the consumption of the, 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 the killing or whatever, if you will, uh, of these insects can be a major nitrogen source for plants. Our buscular mycorrhizae actually significantly contribute to the nodulation and association of rhizobia, nitrogen-fixing bacteria on leguminous plants. Um, they actually work synergistically in a tripartite relationship. So when we're talking about rhizobia and nitrogen fixers, we need to think about the AM fungi. They can uh, work together sort of synergistically with infection and mineral nutrition in the plant growth. Uh, the, the, on one hand, the Fungus provides phosphorus, carbon, and zinc that it sort of brings in through its network, which assists in the nodulation and nitrogen fixation process. And in exchange, the, the bacteria enhances the phosphorus uptake in the fungus and the plant with its own organic acids and phosphatases, uh, digestive enzymes. Uh, the bacteria seem to influence the spore germination, even the growth rate of the fungus. At the same time, the fungus releases what's known as the mike factor, the MYC, and that helps activate the rhizobia formation or the nodulation. And together, they form a beneficial biofilm in what we call the mycorrhizosphere, the, the, the fungal root uh, interface. Um, so they're important there. And so whenever we're bringing in the AM uh, micro, excuse me, the nitrogen fixers, we want to bring in the AM fungi. Uh, lichens are actually an uh, important part of soils. Um, in the background, we see that so, uh, forests start out from bare rock, and usually the first thing sh showing up on that bare rock are lichens, just like in the early earth, the fungal acids produced by the 95% fungal component of a lichen releases those minerals, enables mosses to grow, eventually leading to the climax forest. Uh, in that forest, uh, lichens can actually provide up to 50% of the nitrogen input just through their own nitrogen fixation. In the lower left, we see one of the darker uh, types of lichens that are primarily uh, photosynthesizing due to cyanobacteria. Cyanobacteria can fix nitrogen. So when that lichen falls and decomposes, it releases that into the soil, along with the minerals that it collects out of the atmosphere. Uh, probably a big mineral input into the into soils is due to lichens kind of trapping that out of the atmosphere and falling down and releasing that when they decompose. Um, and even the brighter green lichens in the upper right, like the Liberia pulmonaria lungwort, probably has, it probably needs and, and has a nitrogen fixing bacteria as a part of its ecosystem. Lichens are kind of like micro ecosystems, so it's also fixing nitrogen, and when it falls and decomposes, it provides that to the soil. So up to 50%, a huge, huge input. Nitrogen fixing bacteria do it, lightning does it, lichens also do it uh, as a big part. And uh, lastly, we'll talk about the remediative roles of fungi and sort of their healing uh, capacities. Uh, sh sh sort of simply and shortly put, there's two main ways that fungi can help deal, polluted, deal with polluted soils or help with polluted soils. Um, on one hand is with the heavy metals, which of course are elements on the periodic table that can't be turned into something else. They are what they are. All fungi can do is either move them around or sort of lock them up or bind them up so that they don't harm or interfere with other organisms. Just like plants, many mushrooms can accumulate these metals out of the soil and concentrate them into their uh, fruit body. The question then becomes, what do we do with the heavy metal mushroom? Just like the question with sunflowers is, you know, what do we do with the heavy metal sunflower? Because it can accumulate a lot as well. Unfortunately, we don't have a good answer to that on the backyard scale. Industrially, they would incinerate the plant or mushroom in a way to trap the metals in the ashes. Um, so that is an option, but not accessible for most folks. Uh, generally, we have to just dispose of it as toxic material, unfortunately, but at least we are scrubbing the soily, soil uh, slowly, you know, and this can take generations. It's not a one season process. Uh, in the upper right, we're seeing these Lixinum mushrooms still accumulating radioactive cesium outside Chernobyl, you know, almost 40 years later. So it's a very slow generational process, but fungi do it. And if humans weren't there, the bugs would eat the insect and very slowly over the eons redistribute those uh, metals into trace amounts um, as best they can. In the soil, fungi can also release acids and other compounds, even glomalin, which can bind with metals and sort of stabilize them for an unknown amount of time. Uh, they sort of just stay there in complexes. But later on, other fungi can actually come and re-release those minerals, as we talked about. So it's a you know, metals, heavy metal contaminated soils are difficult and we can't really do much about them and control them. That's why industrially they just scrape the stuff up or they burn it. Not awesome, not great options, but it's 
where we're sort of at. Uh, lastly, uh, perhaps more interestingly, some fungal components on their tissue can actually bind to metals naturally. And when we put these fungal the mycelium into, say, especially like water systems contaminated with metals, the, my, the metals might bind to the mycelium and sort of pull it out in that way. And that's an interesting application that I think is more accessible to folks. Lastly, uh, fungi can break down all kinds of chemicals. And this has been well researched for something like 50 years uh, by many researchers around the world, initially starting out with wood decomposing fungi. Again, these fungi are able to break down the most complex thing in nature. So some smart person a bunch of years ago said, hey, maybe they can break down all the complex chemicals we're inventing as humans. Turns out wood decomposers can break down many of these chemicals, but so can many uh, molds. Uh, the trichoderma molds I mentioned can break down uh, glyphosate, meaning Roundup. Uh, they can break down DDT, uh, many other herbicides naturally. So even simple molds can do this work. Uh, many ectomycorrhizal mushrooms and even uh, our buscular mycorrhizal fungi can break down many chemicals. So it seems to be a, a natural trait of many fungi, even fungi harvested from pristine environments can break down herbicides naturally. Um, the challenge now that we face as people knowledgeable on this topic is how do we translate what we've learned in the lab where most of this work has been done into field-based applications and protocols that are consistent, safe, um, and measurable. And that's sort of the challenge today. Much of my work is trying to advocate for that research and enable people to do it safely and you know intelligently with, with good design. Uh, and then in the upper right, we're showing that uh, different types of fungi can break down even plastics. Uh, this is the fungus there is actually a wood decomposer, not a soil fungus, but um, for the hundred years of plastics uh, existence, many studies have been done around the world where they've buried plastics in the soil to see how they would stand up and Time and time again, every single time they dig up the plastic a year or two later, it's being degraded, slowly broken down, especially by fungi, uh, sometimes even distinct you know, clusters of fungal species. So here again, we know this, yet it hasn't been translated to a larger practice. Hopefully in the future, we will dial this in and, and deal with you know, this major issue. So fungi are pretty, uh, you know, they do so much in our environments. There's actually many ways we can incorporate them into our designs as, say, permaculturalists, if that's your leaning, or just, you know, good farming practices, or even just trying to have a garden in your backyard. Fungi can be incorporated in, in a myriad of ways. Um, you know, so often when I read books on these types of topics, one of the first things I'll do is flip to the index and see how many entries are there for fungi, mycelium, mushrooms. And more often than not, there's you know none or maybe just a couple, and they're very cursory. And I, I point that out just to say you know not that you know nobody knows anything. I mean that is sort of an issue, but more to challenge you to always ask yourself how can fungi fit into this design, even if the book or whoever you're talking to hasn't said it explicitly because it's not necessarily on their radar. Now it's on yours, and you can start to think, hmm, what are fungi doing in the system? What's missing from this analysis? How could fungi be incorporated? And ultimately, cultivating fungi and working with them isn't too complex. You know, biology is is unfathomably complex, but at the same time, it's relatively simple. You know, a seed puts in the soil and it sprouts. Fungi are kind of straightforward in the same way. Once you understand them, it, it doesn't have to be a scary thing. It's just our language and our dialogues need to be a little bit more up to uh, on the same page with each other, so we can start to advance these conversations. Um, so hopefully this talk gave you a good whirlwind introduction to the soil fungal communities and all the things they do. So I want to thank you all for joining uh, in this talk, and I'm really excited to uh, dip into the questions. Last thing I'll say before we do that is uh, as a thank you for watching this talk, you can um, offering a discount on the sell of my book. It's at the website. Uh, below cafeus.com and if you oil enter the coupon code soil uh, when you check out you get five bucks off the book for the next 24 hours so that's going on and otherwise you can check out radicalmycology.com for some free videos there's some a lot of free resources there and we're on social media uh, rad mycology is the handle so with all that being said uh, I guess we'll turn it back over to Raleigh and I guess we'll open it up for questions so thanks everybody yeah, that was fantastic, man. That's it's totally a fire hose of amazing, amazing info. Like the the stuff on glomulin that blew my mind. I, I had no idea that that was the biggest source of carbon. Um, great. All right. So for anyone who wants to learn more about Peter, you can find out more about him on radicalmycology.com, which is great. I posted the link down below, and 
One of you guys, we're going to announce in the webinar replay, which will